modern city. Are these the bones of Dublin's first inhabitants, the Viking men who helped found this city? Or are they the bones of raiders? Predators who came by sea to plunder, kill, and burn. And on our second mummy autopsy, a mummy found in a shanty town in Lima, Peru. It is believed to be from a forgotten civilization that existed 800 years ago. The MIs are here to unwrap the body and reveal its secrets. They will find evidence of a mighty civilization that lived in Peru before the Incas. Sacrifice. Plague. Murder. The clues are in the bones. Every mummy, a body of evidence. A case to be cracked by a new generation of mummy investigators. Bones don't lie. This is the piece of the puzzle that I've been waiting for. The dead don't bury themselves. Somebody put them in the ground. We have to investigate everything. We're going to do whatever it takes. They will apply cutting-edge forensic science to unsolved mysteries across the world, waking the dead to tell their stories. Dublin, Ireland. In the 9th century AD, when there was no city here, the Vikings came. They raided, they stole, and they murdered. They plundered the coast and sailed away. The mummy investigators have come to Dublin to examine the deaths of four warriors who didn't leave. Were they raiders? Thieves? Killers who were themselves killed? Or were they something else? Because eventually some Vikings settled here. This is a city that the Vikings helped to found. The MI's job is to study the deaths of these four men and find their place in history. Are these the bones of Dublin's founding fathers? The mummy investigators are John Schultz, a forensic anthropologist who works on modern criminal cases. He works with law enforcement investigating suspicious deaths. I think for most people there's a mystique with the Vikings. They were raiders, but they were also explorers. I mean, they were some of the greatest explorers in history. James Murrell uses the latest radiologic technology to scan bodies and bones. He has two decades of experience working with the living and the dead. We had badly damaged bones, we had missing bones, no soft tissue, um, and a badly disturbed site. Uh, this case was, was pretty tough for us. They will use their skills, experience, and cutting-edge analytic techniques to reveal the secrets that are locked in the bones. A 1,200-year-old story of greed, bravery, and killing. Dublin, Ireland's capital. Construction work has revealed four bodies. Buried with them, the weapons of war. These are the bones of Vikings, men who lived more than a thousand years ago. It was Viking settlers, colonists from Scandinavia, who helped found what became the modern city. A busy port, a center for trade. Written records of the settlement, called a long fort, are precise. They say it began in 841 AD. Within a few years, it had grown to become a town in its own right, home to more than 4,000 Vikings and an untold number of women and children. Despite its size, no physical trace of the settlement has ever been found. It's one of the greatest archaeological mysteries in Ireland's history. Somewhere beneath these streets lies the key to the beginnings of the city.
has it finally been found? Are these the bones of Dublin's first inhabitants? James Merle and John Schultz are here to find out. They've come to meet archaeologist Lindsay Simpson. She was in charge of excavating the remains. That's good. Well, so what do you have for us today? What kind of condition are the bones in? Well, not very good. I'm afraid they're very, very uh, fragmented. The burial site has been built over for centuries, and the construction work has taken its toll on the body. None of the skeletons are complete. The bones moved and lost as buildings have come and gone. Considering all the construction that is going, has been going on in downtown Dublin for years, I really think it was just, it's amazing, it's really fortuitous that they still, these skeletons were still preserved. Lindsay's hoping that these four bodies might be the missing link that finally proves this is where the first Viking settlers built their long fort. We're missing a big chunk of the very early Viking history at Dublin. So really the first answer you're looking for is, are they just passing through Dublin at the time or had they established a settlement? Yeah, is it, is it a cemetery that's associated with the, with the settlement? Okay. Can the MIs fill in the missing part of Ireland's history? In an effort to pinpoint where these men belong in that history, Lindsay has had the bones carbon dated. Carbon-14 dating is a way of estimating when a living organism died. Throughout its life, every plant or animal exchanges carbon with the world around it. When it dies, the carbon decays and is not replaced. Measure the level of carbon and you have a measure of when death occurred. But carbon dating doesn't always provide neat answers. There's always a calculable margin of error. And it's the margin of error in these four bodies that's prompted Lindsay to call in the MIs. According to the carbon dates, all four bodies could date from the time when history first records the Vikings' presence in Ireland. But they could also date to a time decades earlier. Can the MIs figure out when these men arrived and why they came? The MIs can only use the evidence they have, the bones, the grave goods, and the burial site itself. They begin with the bones. The skeleton they've chosen is the most intact of the four bodies found, and the archaeologists have given it a name, Torkel. Out of all the skeletons, uh, really the most striking of all of them was the largest skeleton. I think the name was Torkel. He was just a very powerfully built individual. I tell you, this is a big, big guy. It is. Now, one thing we need to talk about the biological profile. Yeah, we do. Uh, he's overall very robust. Give us an idea on this guy, how big he is. 54.82, so essentially 55 millimeters. Measurements over 47 millimeters are almost certainly male. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's off the charts. Yeah, yeah, he really is. Yeah. Well, now we know this guy's quite robust. Yes. Pretty big guy. Next question I've got to answer, how old? John can use specific bones to estimate Torkel's age. We could actually start uh, looking at some of the epiphyses. Okay. We can look at the pelvis. You see this line here? Yep. So, I mean, this is the fusion line. We can see it's still preserved. It's almost finished fusing. Yeah. All right. And this we would expect maybe um, late teens, possibly early 20s. Okay. All right. For that to be completely fused, we see the same thing with the head of the humerus. We're probably looking at an individual late teens, possibly early 20s. It's awfully young to die, though. Yeah. He may have been young, but this man lived an active life. One thing I did notice here with some anti-mortem trauma, if we look at some of the lower vertebra, um, we see some Schmerl's nodes or some, some of these depressions that would have been produced by the discs. And so it appears that it, he may have had some disc problems, all of these, all right? One after another with the lower thoracic and almost all the lumbars. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting is I did notice this on a couple of the other individuals probably related to activity. You generally wouldn't see all of these uh, disc problems on individuals this young. Good, good catch. Four Viking warriors, four tough men who died young. What brought them to Ireland's capital? Did they come to plunder or settle? We're trying to put together a big picture of what went on with these individuals. We need to look at all the lines of evidence we have. 
If these four men were raiders, what drew them to Ireland? The mummy investigators consult Professor Donaker O'Coran, an expert on Viking history. They're meeting in an ancient monastery outside Dublin at Glendalough. Because to the pagan Vikings, Christian monasteries were like a magnet. It was nothing to do with religion. It was down to the treasure they stored. So why were the Vikings raiding monasteries? Because monasteries were the sources of concentrated wealth. You, you, by going to the monasteries, you didn't have to beat up all the small farmers. It was okay. practically nothing. And historical records suggest that before Dublin was founded, a monastery stood near the burial site. It would have been enough of a reason for our men to make their way here. Was there anybody guarding the monastery? No, they were not defended settlements. Oh. And they did not expect to be raided. And certainly they didn't expect their altar plate and their chalices and their patterns and other stuff like that, which no Irish lords would uh, plunder. Now we expect uh, young men or old men or both to form a Viking raiding party. And we can figure out something like that from looking at the, the lives of the Viking leaders in Ireland. We see them very active in their 20s. As our four skeletons show, raiding was a young man's job. Now, one thing I noticed when I examined skeletal remains, I saw a very heavily muscle, muscled uh, upper body. These individuals would have had very broad chests. And even with the younger individuals, I was seeing some already some spine degeneration. I mean, would this be consistent with them? Yeah, it uh, would be consistent because they got over here in ships that were the product of a long evolution of shipping in Scandinavia, the Viking longship. They had two methods of propulsion. One was sail, okay. and the other was oar. The outer limit of their rowing was about 50 kilometers, about 35 oh, miles. Pretty so. far. It was okay. pretty far. Yeah. And this was extremely demanding. All right. Standing in that monastery, I really got an idea about how the Irish felt. They had to have been terrified, knowing that these people are coming to raid their village and raid their goods. It's certainly possible that these four men were part of a raiding party, but the mummy investigators must examine all the evidence. They must now turn their attention to the grave goods found in the burial site. They may be damaged, but they have survived centuries in the ground. James joins Lindsay Simpson and Dr. Elizabeth O'Brien, experts on Dublin's early history. To Elizabeth, the fact that the men were buried with anything at all is proof that they were outsiders. They're definitely not Irish. Irish burial practices at this period of time never had grave goods. They were buried in a totally different manner. Really? So they're definitely not Irish. Okay. But are the grave goods evidence of men who'd come to settle or men who'd come to raid? The first item that James spots is at odds with the image of the rough, savage Viking warrior. A comb was found buried alongside Torkel, the strong man whose bones they've just examined. It is almost 12 centuries old. And the first thing that everybody notices is the comb. Everyone loves the comb. And that was buried under his right arm. Okay. Um, you can see it's uh, decorated. Um, they're made from horn, and each of these little teeth are sawn out individually, so very, very painstaking. And then all the plates, you can see them there, are riveted together. So, Betty, is it unusual for someone to be buried with a comb during this time? No, no, not unusual at all. And a comb is, is, is almost a status symbol. Males and females? Males and females. Okay. Uh, males are very fond of their combs for some reason. <laughs> females... So things never change. We're just so vain. Yeah. Something like a comb, it, it is a very personal artifact, and it really did sort of help to give me a, an image of that person. This is a very, another little, uh, sweet little thing. I'd like to take this out for you. This is a bone pin um, that w would have held, it was up on his right hand shoulder, so it would have pinned his tunic together. Okay. The tiny cloak pin carved in the shape of a hair and the intricately worked comb are not the burial offerings James expected to find in a Viking grave. But I guess I didn't realize they had so, such beautiful things. So there was this sort of dichotomy. There was this extra part of their life that, that uh, up until now I had no idea existed. 
But while they're intriguing, these items do not bring the MIs closer to answering their question. Were these men part of a raiding party from outside Ireland, or did they live here? Were they part of the Viking community that helped found the city of Dublin? The answer might lie in the other burial goods. One of the graves contained the remains of a piece of serious military hardware. This is a shield boss. This is the, the metal bit that sits on top of the, the wooden shield. This is all sort of clay that has corroded on, that's jammed onto it, so it has to be picked off very painstakingly. The shield itself was probably about this size. The shield was a crucial part of the Viking's armory. In battle, a shield wall could drive an enemy backwards or repel the most determined attack. Maybe burying a man with his shield was a way of saying that he was first and foremost a fighting man, a warrior. And found nearby a piece from one of the most brutal of Viking weapons, the head of a battle axe. Her eye is taken straight away to the fabulous axe. That's just a very, very beautiful object. And you can see how, uh, how lethal that is. We're holding an inanimate object, but what sort of life did it see? I don't even want to think I about it. I don't want to know either. <laughs> but it certainly would have been a nasty surprise if you were walloped with it. But the grave goods are still confusing. Even Viking settlers would have weapons. We had a lot of conflicting evidence here. So the mummy investigators have decided to carry out a scientific test to help them get closer to the truth. That test is oxygen isotope analysis. Every human being has a unique oxygen isotope signature locked inside their bones. A person's signature depends on where they live and the water they drink. By unlocking the isotope values hidden within these Viking bodies, scientists will establish where these men spent the early years of their lives. While they wait for the results, the MIs look for further clues in the way the men were buried. In almost every Viking cemetery, the bodies are positioned in the same way. Heads to the north, feet to the south. That's not what the MIs see here. So the heads should all be facing this way, and of the four we've got, none of them face that way. Yeah, they're all actually in different directions. Yeah, they're all sort of everywhere. You'd expect any permanent settlement to have an organized cemetery, but that's not what this is. And yet the bodies have been buried with some care. That suggests they were buried by people from their own community. So buried by other Vikings, but in a way that seems almost random. To John, this is compelling evidence that these burials were not connected to a permanent camp. We're able to learn that they were buried at what appears to be some type of semi-permanent settlement. The bodies were found here, just on the edge of what was once a pool off an inlet to Dublin's main river. And nearby, Lindsay and her team discovered a clue that's led some people to believe that this was the site of the massive Longfort settlement. The clue? Clinker bolts, used to repair a Viking longship. But this handful of bolts is the only sign of activity. And for the MIs, it isn't evidence enough to say that this...
an isotope, it really helped present the bigger picture from what we see here. We're looking at probably some of the earliest Vikings that actually may have come into Ireland to essentially raid Ireland. Their investigation complete, it's time for the MIs to present their findings to Lindsay Simpson, the archaeologist who discovered the bodies, and historian Dr. Elizabeth O'Brien. What we're looking at here is probably a Viking camp somewhat associated with Viking raiding parties up very and down possibly, Ireland. Very possibly, okay. at the early period, before they settled. Before they actually came yes. in to settle and yes. sort of establish. Yeah. I think that's the best explanation we've got. Yeah, makes sense. Well, you mentioned there was 150 years that was missing sort of yeah, in Dublin's yeah, history. Yeah, we're very unsure about. And now we're basically saying that they already scouted this place. They already had a routeway in here. They had some sort of uh, occupation, whether it was, as you said, a camp of, yeah. or they were familiar. So that's really important to us because it means that the reason they chose Dublin was that they already knew the lie of the land. So, so no, I am. I have to say now I am. <laughs> I'm coming around to that way of, of thinking. All right. So it's been very useful. We were able to help. I think pull all these different lines of evidence together and I think we were able to show that we're looking at some of the earliest Vikings that would have came into Ireland on raids. We're looking at Vikings. We're looking at potentially some of the earliest Viking raiders coming into Ireland. These men never made it home. But Vikings would continue to come to Ireland. By 841 AD, the beginnings of the permanent settlement that would eventually house 4,000 Viking warriors had begun. It's still out there, somewhere, waiting for someone to find it. The mummy investigators are in Lima, Peru to investigate an ancient mummy bundled in cloth. Discovered underneath a shanty townhouse, it might be Inca, but there's a chance this body dates back even farther to a civilization called the Ichma, about which almost nothing is known. So using radiography, carbon dating, and forensic analysis, the MIs have a chance to open a window onto a vanished world. The MIs are John Schultz, a forensic anthropologist who works with law enforcement agencies on modern cases. It's hard to believe that there must be a skeleton buried underneath all these homes out here living right on top of them. And Ken Nystrom, an expert in human remains who specializes in the ancient dead of South America. Could this mummy be from the ancient Ichma culture? What might it reveal about this forgotten civilization? The latest mummy autopsy takes place on the outskirts of Lima, Peru's capital. Mummy investigators John Schultz and Ken Nystrom are here to examine a mysterious mummy found not in a grand archaeological site, but underneath a house in one of Lima's poorest shanty towns. It is a mummy bundle, a body bound in cloth and tied up tightly before being buried in the dusty ground. The big overriding question is who is this person um, and how do they fit into the context of where they were found in the ground archaeologically. Scientists believe this mummy bundle might be from the ancient Ichma culture. They know very little about this group, this pre-Inca group. So we're trying to tell more about this individual which is going to be part of learning more about this culture. The discovery of the mummy was startling news for the people who live here because underneath the town lie the remains of a vast and ancient cemetery. Mummy bundles generally predate the arrival of the Spanish and are at least 500 years old. But it is believed that this particular bundle could be as much as a thousand years old, dating from the Ichma period. When the Ichma were conquered by the more powerful Incas in the 15th century, their culture was all but eradicated. Archaeologists were left with precious little information about them. One thing they do know is that nearly a thousand years ago, these mysterious people built one of the largest temples in South America, Pachacamac. Pachacamac has always been an important oracle center, a pilgrimage center um, across all kinds of different periods of Andean prehistory. 
The MIs will work with Peruvian archaeologist Luisa Diaz and her team of experts. We know very little about the Ichmas. When the Incas arrived and took over, they built over their cities. And we are only just investigating who they were, what they did. And it's through the study of the mummy bundles that we can find out about their history. The bundle is covered in layers of dirt that may be centuries old. In preparation for the MI's analysis, the team carefully and methodically cleans the outer surfaces. Oh, wow. Look at that preservation. That's incredible. This mummy bundle is in great shape. It doesn't even look like a body could fit in here. I mean, it's pretty short, unless it was a really short person. It's, um, it has to be some kind of hyper-flex position almost. The flexed position is common to South American mummy bundles from all periods. Without scientific analysis, it is impossible to know whether the body inside is Inca or Ichma. That's what's so interesting, is trying to figure out who potentially is in here. To determine how long ago the mummy was made, the team have sent a sample for radiocarbon dating. It's important to radiocarbon date finds to set it definitely within a time period so that we could move out from there and determine more about the, the time period in the individual's life. The results give the MIs the confirmation they were looking for. The radiocarbon analysis placed this individual smack dab in the middle of the, the Ichima culture period. This person lived 800 years ago, about 1200 AD. Now the MIs have the opportunity to reveal information about an almost unknown people. There's very little scientifically known about this group of individuals. And this is just another step of learning more about who these people were. Let's take a look at the x-rays. Next, John and Ken decide to study x-rays of the complete bundle. This will be the first time anyone has seen the body inside. It has remained hidden from view for eight centuries. And it's always important to start out with x-rays. We would do the same thing on a forensic case, see if we can learn any information about the bundle first of all. Like everything's yeah. there. Yeah, we have the feet here. You can also see the hands up here uh, near the mandible. One Ichma body, tightly bunched up, 800 years old. But who is it? Is it a man or a woman? I can't really say much about sex from the pelvis. No. Uh, we do see, however, with the mandible, he's kind of square, and which is consistent with a male. I was able to see the outline of the mandible here, and it looked incredibly robust. And so I immediately speculated, and I was pretty confident that this was a male individual. By looking closely at bones called the epiphyses, which fuse as one gets older, the MIs can say that the person inside is a fully mature adult. Here's all the epiphyses are, yeah. are completely fused. Done growing. Yeah, it's hard to tell with the teeth what's going on, but it does look like an adult, at least for what we're seeing here. Yeah. And then, around the shoulder region of the body, they spot something they can't explain. The only thing that really doesn't look like part of the skeleton, this area here, yeah. something going on there. Among the bones is an artifact that the MIs can't yet identify. What is it? Could it reveal something about the lives or burial traditions of the Ichma? When you see stuff on an x-ray, it's kind of a tease because you know something is in there, but you can't quite identify it. For the next stage of the investigation, the MIs obtain special permission from the Peruvian government. They are going to actually unwrap the mummy bundle. It is exciting to open up a mummy bundle because you don't know what's in it and you don't know what you're going to run into. I almost see it like when you're unwrapping a present and you have no idea what's inside. I mean, you get to peel it back little by little and learn more about this individual. Luisa Diaz and her team will carry out the procedure. It will take all their skill and experience of unwrapping bundles to do the job without damaging the fragile textiles and remains. Even the smallest clues may be vital. They mustn't miss anything. This is the most important part of the investigation. It will take time and patience to get it right. <music> Mummy investigators Ken Nystrom and John Schultz are in Lima, Peru, conducting their latest autopsy. 
From their study of the x-rays, they know that wrapped up inside the mummy bundle is the body of a male. Carbon Dating told the team he lived 800 years ago during the mysterious Ichma period. One of the only things scientists know about this group is that they created this, a mighty religious temple city called Pachacamac. The MIs are working with a team led by Peruvian archaeologist Luisa Diaz. They are unwrapping this bundle to see what may be revealed about this lost civilization. On this investigation, it was really exciting because we couldn't actually see the mummy yet. It was, it was still contained in, it, in the bundle, and so we couldn't see anything, and so it, was, it added a, another punch of mystery to it. To learn more about this mummy, the MIs visit where it was buried, Armatambo. But this is not a typical archaeological site. This mummy lay underneath one of South America's poorest shanty towns, at the edge of the sprawling capital city, Lima. Archaeologists excavated here in 2003, and what they found under the settlement amazed them. It was a vast Ichma cemetery. We could never have imagined we would find the amount of mummies we did. We found 180. It was a real surprise for us, especially the fact that they were found underneath the houses. Another surprising aspect of the mummy burials was that they were all placed facing south, directly towards the massive oracle temple of Pachacamac. The implication is that the mummy's spiritual life may have revolved around Pachacamac, but no direct link between the temple and Armatambo has yet been found. The development of the shanty town is disturbing the archaeological remains underneath. But 500 years ago, the Incas did the exact same thing when they built their own city on top. Experts believe that during the Ichma period, Armatambo was a religious city where people came to bury their dead. This was apparently all ceremonial, mostly ceremonial, during Ichma, and then the burials were on higher up underneath some of those buildings. Obviously, when all these structures went up, I mean, they did disturb much of this area and did ruin some of the archaeological uh, site here. But um, it's nice to see that some of the area is still preserved. When the MIs walk up to where the majority of mummies were found, they discover that recent erosion has revealed even more remains. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Coming out of the walls. Oh, that's incredible. A couple of femurs, a couple of knees. Yeah. It was a surreal experience to go to where this mummy was found because there were literally bones and crania sticking out of this mud wall directly below houses, directly beside houses. Whatever survived of Ichma culture is now at greater risk than ever before. The sprawl of the city threatens to destroy any trace that the Ichmas ever lived. The rescued mummies are amongst the only surviving evidence of the Ichma culture, so the knowledge that the MIs gain unwrapping one is crucial. This mummy had been rescued along with a number of other mummies, and when we went to the site, we really could see why they had to be rescued, why scientists had to come in there and excavate them and remove them, because in the end, they probably would have been disturbed and all the evidence uh, that we were able to collect um, and analyze would have actually been lost for science. Back in the lab, the unwrapping team are ready to reveal the man inside. His face will be seen for the first time in around 800 years. Well, we can see proximal end of both tibias. But from what we're seeing now, there isn't much soft tissue preserved, although we do see some. But it's still hard to tell. This is, I mean, for me, this is very, very cool because it's amazing. I mean, we're undoing a process that was done hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Yeah. That's just a neat concept. This is a crucial moment. As the final layer is peeled back, the MIs get the first glimpse of the head. Wow, that's excellent. The face is covered with wads of cotton for protection underground. As these layers are carefully removed, the MIs come face to face with the dead man. There was a lot of humanity on the face when 
it was exposed because there, there were, the hair was completely intact. The face itself was skeletonized to a degree. It can be a little unnerving to see a face staring back at you. In terms of some of these investigations I've been able to work on, I think the mummy bundles have been the most exciting. As each layer comes back, we start to learn more and more about the particular skeleton. As the body becomes more and more exposed, one thing the MIs notice is the 800-year-old smell. There was more of a smell once we unwrapped it. It's definitely a mummy smell, but it smells a lot more like natural decomposing flesh to me. Than... It's not like a new body, obviously, which is really intense. It's a smell of really old death. The mummy is wearing something wrapped around his head, and Ken notices that it is not just an ordinary rope. It's an old knot. See? It is an old knot. It's a one-handed sling for hunting. Yeah. Okay. In skilled hands, an onda, or sling, could be amazingly accurate. With a stone shot able to reach speeds of more than 100 miles per hour, it could also be lethal. It gives them an insight into the rituals the Ichma used to prepare the dead. The fact that he was buried with his sling you know, tells me that the people that buried him knew that it was one of his possessions, that they knew him personally, such that they would include one of his own possessions with him in a bundle. It is thought the Ichma were probably fishermen as they lived by the sea. And John thinks he sees evidence to support this on the man's teeth. We don't see any evidence of cavities or carious lesions, which would be consistent with a diet higher in coastal resources. To confirm this, the MIs send off a bone sample for a procedure called stable isotope analysis. It measures the level of specific nitrogen and carbon isotopes that enter the body through food sources. The results show that this man was probably a fisherman. The majority of his food did come from the sea. The stable isotope analysis of his diet that we did perform did indicate that his diet was primarily composed of marine resources. On the x-rays, they saw an unidentifiable metal object. Now that the mummy is unwrapped, the MIs find that these objects are grave goods placed with the body for its journey to the afterlife. These are tweezers, <laughs> little bronze, tiny little tweezers. This guy used this thing and then they gave it to him when he died and made sure that he wasn't going to lose it. They find another bizarre offering in the man's mouth. This is a piece of cotton and it actually has a shape of the upper mouth because yeah. that's where it's almost like a retainer. Mm -hmm. There seem to be traces of silver, maybe a precious offering to the gods. But the MIs can only speculate. We may never know why the Ichma placed these goods with their dead. The investigation is still providing important new information about the lives of the Ichma and their death rituals. The MIs want to know more. are in Lima, Peru to discover the secrets inside an ancient mummy bundle. The investigation is revealing the story of one man's life and of the mysterious civilization in which he lived. What we're doing here is using multiple lines of evidence looking at the skeleton to tell his story. On the mummy's head, they make an important discovery. They find traces of a bright red mineral called cinnabar. Cinnabar, naturally occurring mercury. Very carcinogenic. <laughs> the cinnabar is indicative of an intricate burial ritual. It implies that before being placed in the ground, part or all of the man's head was painted bright red. The MIs believe this could represent an important part of Ichma religious tradition because it ties him to the temple of Pachacamac. 15 miles south of Armatambo, there's evidence there that this coloring meant something to the Ichma. 
Today, it is a dusty mound that blends into the arid landscape. But 800 years ago, the painted temple, as it is now known, was also colored bright red. He would have seen it. It's this huge adobe pyramid, and so it would have been an obvious landmark. It would have been something to refer to. Experts think this was in honor of the sun, a focus of worship for many South American cultures. Whatever the meaning, our man was buried facing towards it. There appears to be a link between the painted temple and the coloring on his head. The cinnabar find also indicates to the MIs that the Ichma were not restricted to this patch of coast. The mineral is naturally found hundreds of miles away in the high Andes. It means the Ichma must have had vast trade links. And another discovery suggests the network was even wider. Another really, really cool thing, some echandra seeds with holes drilled through them for a necklace. Which, I mean, the Nectonor seeds are only from the Amazon basin, so, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles to the east. Now that it has been fully unwrapped, the MIs can examine the entire body. The first thing they note is that traces of skin and soft tissue have survived on the bones. And that's still flesh on top of there, and all the dark stains, actually. Being able to handle the body allows the MIs to be more precise about his age. The best criteria, obviously, is the, the face of the pubic symphysis, and it's a phase three, phase four. So he was a 30 to 40 year old guy. By our standards, this was a young death, but to the Ichma, he lived a full life. This time period, individuals probably weren't living nowhere as long as we do now with all the advances in health. So for him, he could have been an older individual in his group. A simple calculation based on the length of the thigh bone tells them that the man stood about five foot six inches tall. He was a short little guy, but I mean, his bones are pretty robust. Yeah, he was stocky. Short but strong. Yeah, he yeah. would have been stocky. Yeah. The evidence on this body says that he was able to eat well and healthily. It is in stark contrast to the present day, where generation after generation struggles to survive on the bit of coastline where the Ichma settlement once stood. <laughs> Through forensic analysis, the MIs have learned a great deal about the man inside the bundle and about the period in which he lived. He belonged to a lost tribe, the Ichma. Only now are details of how they lived coming to light. This man died at the height of the Ichma culture. His mummified body gives us an insight into what these people were like. He was not a king or leader, but a simple man afforded a simple burial. It does not appear that this was a, any type of status individual just based on the grave goods that were in there. Could have just been a regular person. And it provides more information in a way about the everyday life of these people. He was probably a fisherman working to feed the people he loved. A 30 to 40 year old man, fairly physically active based upon his bones and his diet was mainly marine resources. The Ichma built the mighty temple of Pachacamac, the center of their spiritual universe. The Ichma people, this guy would have interacted with that temple, with that oracle. The Ichma were well connected, trading goods over vast distances. I think the work we did in this case uh, was very important, even though we looked at one individual, but we're still, in the end, we're still learning more about this particular culture. The MI's timely mission has opened a window onto this forgotten culture, unlocking secrets that were nearly lost forever.